When the paraclete, the spirit of truth, has come, he will convince the world of sin and of justice and of judgment. Words taken from today's Holy Gospel. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Recently, Holy Mother Church celebrated, at least on the traditional calendar, the feast of St. Paul of the Cross, founder of the Congregation of the Passion. St. Paul of the Cross lived in the 18th century in Italy, and he was known for his purity. He was known for his innocence, and especially known for his immeasurable love of Christ crucified and for Our Lady of Sorrows. This holy man, St. Paul of the Cross, was inspired to found a religious community when he saw a vision of the Blessed Mother dressed in a black tunic along with a holy badge upon her breast that announced the passion of Jesus Christ. The Holy Virgin then spoke to St. Paul the Cross saying, quote, My son, you see that I am clothed in mourning. This is because of the sorrowful passion of my son. Therefore, you are to clothe yourself likewise and to found a congregation in which the members will also be clothed in the same manner. And they are to mourn continually for the passion and death of my dear son. Unquote. Words of the Blessed Virgin. St. Paul the Cross would indeed found the Passionists, and he would wear all black as a habit, and he would preach Christ crucified by means of parish missions and retreats. And he would often preach upon large platforms erected in churches and would often point to a life-size crucifix as he spoke. This holy founder would also literally scourge himself as he preached, scourging himself publicly to the point of drawing blood in order to show the horror of human sin, but also the infinite mercy of the good Lord. Now, it should be noted that St. Paul the Cross, founder of the Passionists, even as a boy, had a great love for those who were outside the church, a great love for heretics. And his prayers for them were continual and fervent, especially for those who lived in England and were filled with the errors of King Henry VIII, Thomas Cranmer, and Anglicanism in general. In his spiritual journal or diary, St. Paul the Cross wrote, quote, I had the special desire for the conversion of heretics and especially of England with its neighboring kingdoms. And I made special prayer for this during my holy communion, unquote. How many prayers for England, especially with the recent coronation of an arch heretic in the person of King Charles III, that he would convert to the one true faith. He would pray, St. Paul the Cross would, for his entire life, for the return of Our Lady's dowry, or England, to the one true faith. One author wrote about St. Paul the Cross, quote, England was always the country of his special fondness and love. It might almost seem to some who knew St. Paul the Cross that he had no heart, no feeling except for England, England was always in his thoughts. England was constantly the subject of his discourses. England was always before him in his prayers. And for the space of 50 years, he prayed for England without intermission, unquote. Well, you might ask, were all these prayers even worth it? All those prayers recited by St. Paul, the cross, were they ever answered? How's England today? Well, in some small way, they were. Granted that there was no immediate return, a glorious return, in fact, of England to the one true faith, but there was what is called a second spring in the 19th century, a flourishing of Catholicism in that country, mainly due to the Passionists. You see, St. Paul the Cross had the consolation of seeing some of his own spiritual sons travel to England where they would labor for the salvation of that beloved country. This was a grace accorded to him during one of the last masses that he was able to celebrate on earth. 
He had obviously been wrapped in ecstasy during the celebration of the Holy Sacrifice. And when Mass was over, St. Paul the Cross exclaimed in reply to questioning, his face still radiant with joy, he said, Oh, what I have seen. My children in England, my religious brothers in England, unquote. Years after the death of this holy saint, a member of the Congregation of the Passion, a member of the Passionist, namely Venerable Dominic Barbary, would do great work in the vineyard of England. This saintly Passionist, whom the famous Cardinal Manning was to call an apostle to England, would bring in an Anglican cleric named John Henry Newman into the Catholic Church. And as Dominic Barbary led Newman through the renunciation of his heresy and provided a conditional baptism, Venerable Dominic Barbary felt blessed to receive this famous and learned thinker into Christ's fold. Blessed Dominic stated, quote, What a spectacle. What a spectacle it was for me to see John Henry Newman at my feet. All that I had suffered since I left Italy has been well compensated by this event. I hope the effects of such a conversion may be great. That was England's second spring. On the following Sunday after that reception of Newman to the church, Newman and four companions, also converts, went to the Catholic chapel of St. Clement's at Oxford for Mass. All, literally all of England soon knew that these men had left the errors of Protestant Anglicanism and were now followers of Christ in the one true religion. Now, on April 18th, this year, just a few days ago, really, it was reported that about 50 Anglican ministers, including some quote-unquote female priestesses and female deacons who are not in communion with the Catholic Church, took part in religious services at the highest-ranking major basilica in Rome. The clergymen were led in their liturgy to the main altar of St. John Lateran Archbasilica in Rome, the most important church on earth. And they were led to that altar by the Anglican minister, Jonathan Baker, who was a fake bishop, literally a high-ranking Freemason, and divorced and remarried Anglican. The Anglican communion, of course, broke away from the one true church in the year 1534 AD because of the lustful and murderous King Henry's decision to make himself head of the Church of England. Catholic Church has repeatedly and officially declared that Anglican holy orders are invalid, which means their ministers cannot validly celebrate Mass, and their clerics are simply playing around with bread and wine. Some have described modern Anglicanism, in fact, as being a religion where everything changes except the bread and the wine. It is said that Pope Francis met with the lay bishop, Jonathan Baker, and other clergy men and clergy women on their visit to Rome, but it's unclear how, how possibly, or why, they were given authorization to conduct a religious service at the most important church in Rome. St. John Lateran is the oldest basilica in Rome. And it's literally the cathedral of Rome. For it contains the papal seat with papal authority. The cathedral of Rome, therefore, is not St. Peter's Basilica. That's not the cathedral. But rather St. John Lateran, which is called the Arch Basilica because it is the most important of the four major papal basilicas in the internal city. A Latin inscription is carved on the marble facade of that great church of St. John Lateran. And that marble inscription reads, quote, Omnium orbis et orbis ecclesiarum mater caput. Mother, this is the church of St. John Lateran. It is the mother and head of all the churches of the city of Rome and all the churches of the entire world. This is 
central headquarters of the entire Catholic Church. Again, St. John Lateran is the site of the papal throne. It's where the throne of Peter resides, a symbol of authority. And the magisterium of the Bishop of Rome, visible head of the entire Catholic Church. And it was at this altar of the Bishop of Rome, the papal altar, on which the Anglican ceremony took place. And it was on the chair reserved for the Pope of Rome that an Anglican layman, quote-unquote bishop, would have sat and presided over this invalid, blasphemous liturgy. Again, a fake bishop, divorced and remarried, and a free Masonic individual on the papal throne. Truth is stranger than any fiction you could imagine. St. John Ladder became the setting for false worship. This is a direct violation of the first commandment, the most important commandment of all. False worship. To worship God according to a right contrary to the precepts of the gospel is false and unlawful. Pope Paul IV wrote to Catholics back in England when they were suffering under King Henry VIII and those who came after him, people who were dying for the faith because of the errors of Anglicanism, Pope Paul IV warned Catholics in England, quote, we are forced to admonish you that on no account are you to go to churches of heretics or hear their sermons or join in their rituals, lest you incur the wrath of God. For it is not lawful for you to do such things without dishonoring God and hurting your own immortal souls, unquote. But oh, things have changed. First, there was Pachamama at St. Peter's Basilica. And now sinful rituals upon the main altar of the mother church of the entire Christian world. You know, according to history, it was in the year 1550 AD that the Protestant Anglican Book of Common Prayer, the Book of Common Prayer, under the kingship of Edward VI, came into force, replacing what? The Roman Pontificale, the Roman book for bishops that are connected with ordaining men to the episcopacy, ordaining men to the priesthood, the diaconate, the minor orders, confirmation. That book is now being taken away from us as we speak. The Roman Pontificale, the new heretical, Book of Common Prayer manifested, according to Catholic theology, defects of form and intention. Just by reading that book, you know that it's invalid, all the Anglican orders. The liturgical book not only denied the sacrament of holy orders, but it also established a new supper liturgy, which replaced the Mass as the representation of the sacrifice of Calvary in an unbloody manner with the consecration of bread and wine into the body and blood of our Lord. Queen Elizabeth, who became head of this heretical sect known as Anglicanism, chose as Archbishop of Canterbury a Matthew Parker, who was invalidly ordained as a bishop according to that book of common prayer. Parker then consecrated other Anglican bishops, all according to the same liturgical books, of King Edward VI, making all of them invalid. From them and through successive consecrations came the Anglican Episcopate, which the true church has declared defective. Pope Leo XIII of Holy Memory, in a famous letter, must reading today, Apostoli Cecure confirmed and renewed the decrees of all his predecessors solemnly proclaiming that by defect of form and intention, quote, ordinations carried out according to the Anglican rite have been and are absolutely null and utterly void, unquote. So what does that mean? What did we witness? As one writer put it, this means that the Anglican bishops are not bishops. The priests are not priests. And the masses they celebrate are not real masses. 
papal altar, the Archbasilic of St. John Lateran, therefore, has been made a stage for a pantomime offensive to the authority of the Holy See and to the Catholic faith. Officials at St. John Lateran stated that this was an, quote-unquote, unfortunate event that was caused by a lack of communication. The same writer I mentioned earlier remarked on this apology saying, quote, a statement like the one issued by the Lateran, apart from its good intentions, is not adequate because what has occurred is an outrage and it deserves solemn acts of reparation. And if there was no malice in anyone's part, the matter appears even more grave because it means that this has been permitted by divine providence to show the abyss of confusion in which the church is immersed today, unquote. As a final note, I must admit that I find this whole explanation coming from officials to be laughable, seemingly dishonest, seemingly disingenuous, seemingly deceitful. I mean, did officials at that particular archbasilica not see those Anglican women ministers' investments? Was that perhaps a little bit of a sort of a hint that this was not a Catholic ceremony? Did the officials check letters of suitability? If I offer Mass anywhere outside this diocese, I must have a letter of suitability. Must. Were they checked? Were these letters checked before they opened up the safe and gave sacred vessels meant for the sacrifice of the Mass, gold vessels to those who were present at the altar? Did they look at those letters before they gave them the tabernacle key? And we might ask for any extra Anglican breads reserved in that tabernacle. And so we find ourselves in the strangest of situations today where a true, valid, Catholic priest of God cannot offer the traditional Latin Mass at St. John Lateran. And yet Anglicans can offer false worship at the altar of the Mother Church of all. You know, St. Paul the Cross prayed for the conversion of England. Perhaps we need this saint, along with Venerable Dominic Barbary, to offer prayers now for the Church of Rome in her confusion and the diabolical orientation that is present right now in the eternal city. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.